Attention pro athletes. Want to secure your financial legacy and thrive off the field? Oak Bridge Wealth Management, led by wealth manager Chris Anasetti, is your dedicated financial planning ally. But don't take it from me. Take it from the Dallas Cowboys, Tyler Biotish. He says, Chris set goals financially and has been incredibly impactful in my journey in the NFL. Experience our customized, comprehensive approach, trusted by top NFL players. Don't leave your financial success to chance. Connect with Chris on Instagram at OakbridgeWM underscore Anaceti. That's OakbridgeWM underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. And let Oakbridge Wealth Management guide you across the goal line. Welcome back to a very special episode of not just Believe in Badgers, but also Believe in Buckeyes. Could not be more pumped to be here today. I'm Matt Perkins, joined as always with Badger legend, the Hebrew hammer himself, Matt Bernstein. Bernie, how are we doing today? Yeah, I'm excited. I know these guys are going to talk me, try to talk me down, but I'm excited for this week. Uh, you know, it's, you're always on pins and needles when you're when you're playing at, at Ohio State at home. You know, there's something about that, um, and I know we'll get into it. But even if it's 0.01 percent, man, I'm I'm still juiced up. I'm going to be there, so I'm pumped, and I'm really pumped to hang out with these guys and talk to them about about their team. Yeah, I'm I'm pumped about it as well. We're trying to get a little campaign for Bernie to be uh to be honorary captain alongside David Gilreath uh this week. So go check that out <laughs> on the Twitters. Uh but we are here today with Jim D. Chekwa and Brian Browning of Believe in Buckeyes, uh two guys who I love following on Twitter for the OSU uh insights, not just because like I'm a bit of an OSU hater, but because like they like they bring the real like they're they're not going to sugarcoat anything i love these guys so it's an honor to have both of you here with us today yeah thanks for having us man i'm uh i have bad memories going to playing wisconsin <laughs> at wisconsin at night actually you know their head coach it was part of those memories as well uh coach yeah. Yeah. but we know we don't i don't want to talk too much about that we're not, we're not expecting one percent chance that you're giving Wisconsin to, to do something. I think it's too high. It's too much. But yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me here. Oh yeah, yeah. It, yeah but once again, we 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 respect the jump around, man. So you know, we, yeah. we we'll be ready. <laughs> well, absolutely. And and I know Badger fans are looking forward or hoping, I should say, for a little bit of a different result than last year because last year was ugly. Uh, against the Buckeyes for Wisconsin down there in the horseshoe. We're going to talk about all that and more here in just a moment. Before we do, want to remind everyone tuning in that we are presented by betonline.ag, where they continue to be your number one source of all of your online sports wagering needs. You name it, they've got it over there at Bet Online. Head on over to the website, use your mobile device to sign up today, receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit with our promo code BELIEVE. That's B L E A V, Bet Online where the game starts. All right, gentlemen, let's get started here. Uh, talking a little bit more about you guys uh, for, uh, for our Badger fans who may not know you guys as well or want to catch up with everything they've seen since they last saw you on the field in Camp Randall Stadium uh, back in 2010. So we, we've got we got Chimdi and Bryant. So, But you guys go way back. You guys came in together to uh, Columbus together and sort of, uh, my understanding is sort of like hit it off immediately, Jimmy. Yeah, we uh same year, both came in in 2006. Um, we're roommates our freshman year. At some point during our freshman year, we became roommates. And from that, we were we were roommates for the kind of our rest, the rest of our time at Ohio State. Really connected. I think, um, you know, our approach to life, I think, is similar, <laughs> I guess I would say. Um, <laughs> Post-playing career, post-NFL career, we also started a business together, barbecue restaurant. Um, that you know we we did with a couple other partners. So yeah, we're, we're we're connected now. We have the Believe in Buckeye show, so we're still we're still at it. We both have three young uh, kids, so we're you know we're 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 competing in that in that realm as well. So <laughs> <laughs> it's all love, yeah. <laughs> I'm no longer competing. This for well, that's, I mean, that's good stuff. You guys are back in Columbus these days. I know hosts and believe in Buckeyes, um, which like I said, freaking awesome show guys. And so I want to, I want to talk about this year's game here in just a minute, but I do want to ask you guys a little bit about, 
uh, playing against Wisconsin for because you guys faced off against them, you know, four times, you know, four times in a row, 07 through 2010 and four very closely contested games. What were some of your memories just against playing Wisconsin in general, whether it was in Camp Randall or at the shoe? What do you I'll start with you, Brian. Like, what do you remember about those games against uh, Wisconsin? Uh, whenever you come to the Wisconsin game, it's all about the line play, both sides of the ball, offensive, defensive, defensive line. Um, so that was always my mindset. You know, Wisconsin is legendary for their offensive line play. And so going into that game, we knew essentially it's our job to kind of step it up. You know, Ohio State off the line, we're going to have to step it up and, and kind of bring it as well. Um, we always, every week, it was always a goal to win a Russian battle. And against Wisconsin, we felt like, you know, that's really important because we know they really want to run the ball. So we could beat them in a Russian battle. Give us a really good chance to win that game. It always was a, a t- tough fought game, a physical game. Um, and yeah, you knew going into Wisconsin week, it was, uh, you know, it was time to uh, buckle up that chin strap a little extra tight, um, and be ready to uh, do some, uh, extra hitting. And then you worry about, you know, resting the days after that, but kind of get ready to gear it up because it's really on our, it's on our backs. Whoever's going to win that game. So Brian said something that might've been missed. Buckle up the chin strap extra tight. I, when we play Wisconsin, I check my chin strap before every single play. It's the only game, <laughs> it's literally the only game where I go like this and check my chin strap before every play because it was it was just a different mindset. You know, you get used to in college football, you get used to every team kind of being similar in terms of offensive style of play. And I'm I would I'm assuming at some point with or maybe now Wisconsin is transitioning into that, you know, similar style. But back when we played, you know, I was an I was another linebacker. I was a fourth, fifth linebacker. Mm-hmm. If I was in the boundary, I was lined up if I saw. The fullback, if I listen, if I saw a fullback coming my way, I blitzed. I'm blitzing because I'm gonna get him before he gets me. That's, that's <laughs> that was my mind the entire game. If this pass, I trust my ability to hit, turn, and run and chase whoever uh may be running free. So it was it was just a different mindset. It was it was it didn't really matter as much, at least defensively, it didn't matter as much how their season was going, because for us, we had to match the intensity from a physicality standpoint. That's how we were going to win. Let's master intensity. From We know we have the talent, but they're going to hit. So we got to hit them before they hit us. And then after that, then we'll figure out how to win the game. So that was kind of our, our, our approach every time playing Wisconsin. Yeah, Jimmy, it's interesting because because you guys did have the athletes. And coming into it from our end, it was we got to be physical. We got to do what we do well and and play tough football. But, but I, I'm sure this has happened to you, but our coaches, they came in hot on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, like playing always, we made t-shirts. Like these guys came in, like this was like the epitome of our entire season. Um, And so I remember like that, I remember the weight room being, you know, jacked up, going crazy. Uh, And then just, even if you're playing there, like it's, you guys played there every game, but to come into, we only only played there once in my career, you know, you're playing in some place that is magical. Like it is like that place that everyone's like, well, you go to the big 10, that's Ohio state, that's Michigan country, you know? And you're like, well, yeah. And I want to play these teams, right? Like it's hot to play these teams. Um, So I just remember like coming in and everyone saying, yo, Bernie, AJ Hawks over there. What's his name? Reynolds. Who is the other guy? And they're like, all these dudes are the best guys. Yeah. If you want to be the best, you got to beat these guys. So I just remember my putting on my chin strap, getting my ankles taped extra tight and saying, <laughs> Dude, I will go. I will break my face mask on anyone during these games, and I think I tried to do that. A couple <laughs> <of> times. <Yeah. laughs> Did the face mask Did work? Did the face mask? Uh, they, it held up. But you remember the old, the new Rydell ones? You guys probably had maybe the same helmets. They were they were thinner um, face masks, so they would bend if you got a, a big hit. Yeah. And then yeah. the, it was just annoying on your head, right? Like it would bend and then it would push there, and I hated that feeling. So they would carry two helmets for me uh, <laughs> to different games. But, man, I just remember, like, it, every game was always exciting against Ohio State. Mm-hmm. And I, I no, ma- no matter what you guys think, I think we have a, a, a chance for this game to be exciting. Just a chance. If that's all you're going to give me, I'll take it. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a chance. I haven't watched a lot of Wisconsin play this year. So, you know, my my memory may not be – I know, I know I, I've seen some of – you know, the run game, I see, I forget the, the specific running back, but he's having like five or six yard carry, it seems like. 
Mm-hmm. But it, they, the, their offense, the way they run their offense, have they come into the modern era of football, or is it still the same downhill run, run, running attack? From- it is very different. So we had uh, offensive coordinator Phil Longo on our show, God, back in like February or March. And, you know, he brought in the air raid from North Carolina. And Coach Longo said they have no more use for fullbacks. There are no more fullbacks on the roster. Mm. Um, you know, they, they turned the fullbacks into either tailbacks or tight ends. They had to choose one or the other, basically. Um, and it is everything's in the shotgun. Everything is, you know, the base personnel is now uh, the base personnel is now 11 personnel. There's three receive three or four receivers out there. Most of the time, even the defense is different. It's a three. They're running a three, three, five now under uh, coach Fick and coach Mike Tressel, the nephew of your former head coach. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, which, which there's a lot of ties now in this game between, you know, coach fickle who you guys played for. So we want to pick your brains a little bit more about <laughs> coach Fick, um, especially you, Jim D because he was your co DC um, yeah. when you were there and was the linebackers coach and was really involved. So what were some of your like memories of playing for coach Fick? Yeah, so Brian knows this. Coach, Coach Fickle could string together a sense of cuss words in a way <laughs> that it makes complete sense. And I don't know if there were nouns, verbs, uh, adjectives, or whatever, but you know, you, the whole team will hear it if you, you made a mistake and he, he'll let you know about it. But Fick, you know, honestly, if I go through my, and I play for a lot of coaches, I play for the Raiders in the NFL. So, you know, I have a <laughs> lot of coaches, right? Um, <laughs> If I go through my list of coaches, I think Coach Fickle is probably in my top three or four coaches that I've ever played for. And the, and the primary reason why is his ability to understand the nuance and the gray areas in football. It's like, you know, coaches come up with scheme, especially defensively. You come up with scheme. You say, this is, you know, this is what the offense is doing. This is what we need to do. But there's so much an offense can do to put you in bad positions. And Fickle understood it. And he didn't just understand, you know, the, the, the ins and outs of, you know, where the weakness of the defense is, how they're going to you know, put us in bad positions. But he understood who had what strength, right? He'd understand, like, okay, look, this is our this is our game plan, Chim, going in, but they start completing some passes. We're going to have to – we have to lean on you to cover a little bit more. And, you know, and, and, and if, if they start running the ball or whatever, we're going to have to lean on you to cover a little bit more and we have to uh, focus, you know, try to focus on stopping the run. But we may stay in cover four. But to you, cover four may be man to man across the entire field. You may not get any help, right? So it was it was his ability to just understand the Florida, the Florida game, you know, where they're attacking and how can I lean to this, the strengths of the players to make sure we put everybody in the best position to be successful. So that's one thing I, I really loved about Coach Fickle. So, what I got to say about Coach Fickle, uh, what I remember most about him is just how tough he was. I think head coach Fickle's a little bit different from position coach Coach Fickle. <laughs> but back in when we were in school, you know, first day of pass, you know, you do, do hooting holler. I know it was basically across the nation. Everybody do hooting holler. You know, Fickle was a defensive lineman uh, for Ohio State. So, you know, he was coaching linebackers at Ohio State. But he was being there nose in. And every hooting holler, somehow, some way, Fickle face would be bleeding. We, we don't know exactly what, was, what exactly caused it. But somehow he would get into it, get into the scuffle right with us, and, and his face would be bleeding. I know the head coach, he's a little bit more um, – he's not that crazy anymore, I don't right. think. Right? <laughs> I, I don't think. But when back in the day when he was the position coach, like, Fickle was intense. So offensively, going against Fickle, going against his linebackers, we know all the great linebackers that he coached at Ohio State. Um, be ready because they're going to be smart players, and he's going to have those guys ready to go. And fired up, and like I said, with that strain of, uh, of uh, explicits that he could shoot out at you, get <laughs> everyone's attention. And uh, yeah, he, he was that guy. Though. He was definitely uh, someone that was locked in and a tough guy for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I after meeting him a bunch, I think he's matured a, a bunch. To I don't see him. I don't think he's ever cursed in front of a bunch of people, which is really interesting coming from uh, <laughs> position coach now. But but when you guys when you guys saw that. that transition was happening from Cincinnati to the big 10 to Wisconsin. Was that exciting for you? Are you excited when coaches and people who played for Ohio state are coming? I don't say just coming to the big 10, obviously teams are going to play and face, but is that exciting? And what, what did that feel like for you guys? Yeah, I was super excited, man, because you mentioned that, that maturity, I think 
we saw we saw that transition at Ohio State from my freshman year to my senior. I don't you probably know like the year after I left, Fickle was interim head coach for a year, but he had settled like in terms of stringing together those experiences. He had he had he's done he was doing less and less at that time. He was more understanding of how players feel. I remember my senior year, I wasn't voted captain, and I remember. Coach Trestle announcing the captains. And then before I left the team meeting room, Fickle was right there talking to me. And he was like, look, I was in a similar situation my, my senior year. I expected to be a captain. I wasn't voted captain. We're going to need you to be a leader on this team. And I'm I'm like, I don't, I didn't know, like it wasn't my position coach to talk to me, right? It wasn't the safety mm-hmm. coach. It was Coach Fickle immediately. And I don't know if he saw my face. I don't even remember. I don't know what 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 led him to do that, but you could see him starting to transition a little bit at that time. But yeah, I was super excited for him. Um, he seemed like, at first I thought he was never going to leave Ohio. I'm like, the figure was, I know he's getting all head coaching offers. Like at some point you got to get out of the state. <laughs> you know? um, but I think the Wisconsin move fit him in terms of, you know, Brian talked about his toughness. Um, when I think Wisconsin, I think toughness. I think that move fit him. Um, I, I'm, I'm also a little bit concerned. I'm rooting for Fickle. So my concern, you know, at, at Wisconsin, one is I like the old style of play. Even if even if you modernize the offense a little bit, I still like the old style of play because I think it's con- contrasted to a lot of what you see. And as a defensive back, I used to go into the Wisconsin game like, I got to play differently. You know, I have to prepare differently. I may actually wear a little bit more pads for this game. And that, that shift... <laughs> Is different. The way Michigan plays is different than Penn State. And when Ohio State plays Penn State, I don't care how good Penn State is. Ohio State's the better team, and they play a similar style. They're going to beat them. It's just going to beat them. It's just what it comes down to. It could be a tough game, whatever, you're going to beat them. But that Michigan game, when things change a little bit and it becomes a brawl, it's just like, you know, who who really is, is going to last the longest. So um, that's my biggest concern, I think, for Fickle. But, yeah, I'm rooting for him, except for this game. Not room for <laughs> Well, uh, Brian, I got a question here. Do you think that Fickle brings that edge that might be able to get us over the hill with Ohio State? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I definitely. I mean, I, I, I'm not taking it that lightly. I know you were talking about point one, and uh, you think that's too high. <laughs> I, I'm not taking this game lightly at all. Because the one thing I know about Coach Fickle is, that, like, like Tim says, he, as always, he's always been a very good, smart coach. And you've seen it at Cincinnati. Um, those teams were very successful for a reason. I mean, like he he always they got got stayed in the game. Defensively, they was exquisite, and that kept him in the game. Is then essentially once he kind of got the personnel on offense at the quarterback and running back position, you know, they kind of took off from there. So um, this year, I don't know, you know, if Wisconsin has those guys in the backfield, you know, that that could bring that type of explosion. But I know if if he can or if he can figure it out, he's going to get it out of those guys. So. Uh, it's a night game. I looked at the weather beforehand. It's gonna be a tad. It's gonna be cold in Wisconsin. It's be cold uh, Saturday night. Um, so I'm not taking it very lightly at all. I know our team. Uh, like I said, we obviously we got a lot of talented guys across the bunch. But they going to the game thinking it's night. It's Wisconsin. We always beat Wisconsin. I can easily see. You know, we're just coming <laughs> off a big win, right, against Penn State. How they could go in there and not essentially be locked all the way in and it be become an issue. So I'm concerned. You got a lot of ties to Ohio. <laughs> what better way to kick off the Wisconsin program by beating Ohio State your first year as the head coach? You know, and uh, when, so when I'm not I totally agree. At all. <laughs> when Fickle signed on, everyone circled this game. So it's been circled since the day he said yes. So yeah, I, yeah. that's what gives me excitement. I, only because we're the underdog and – like you were saying, Chindi, we it's a night game. It's at Camp Randall. It's going to be crazy there. Like, people are going to be nuts. We just beat Illinois literally Halloween in the weekend, fourth quarter. It's which, Halloween weekend. Halloween, if you guys don't know, Halloween in Madison is something very different and unique and is an experience that I'd recommend people do in their early 20s and not <laughs> once we're into our – so we missed our window is what you're saying. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I think y'all might have missed your window, especially now. Yeah, once you got once you got kids, it's a little bit tougher to enjoy a, 
Are they still calling it Freak Fest, Bernie? I don't know. They they called it. I, don't it know. I, I kept my day. eyes and ears away. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I. I'm a little. Funny, they might have changed that name. <laughs> the second I got married, I didn't never heard Freak Fest again in my life. <laughs> Well, let's, talk, <laughs> let's, let's talk about this game a little bit more. Let's talk about the Buckeyes a little bit more because I've been watching. You know, I, th- I think everyone you know watched the Buckeyes. Everyone watched that Notre Dame game, which was epic. I think you know. I know Bernie and I were both watching the Penn State game bef- as our sort of our hors d'oeuvre to our main course of Wisconsin Illinois last weekend. And to me, from the outside, like this Ohio State team is much more like the teams that y'all played for than it has been the teams that we've seen over the last five, six years under Ryan Day. This looks from the outside like a defense first team that has, you know, has one elite dude on offense and Marvin Harrison Jr. and then a bunch of injured running backs. And so like what, how would you assess the state of the Buckeyes going into this week? And what would you say like is sort of like the best part about this team right now and what needs the most improvement? Oh, so I would say, in terms of the best part, is the approach. I think Ryan Day, the last five years or so, really approached it more of, you know, we have great talent. We're gonna come up. We're gonna come up with great scheme. And between having great talent, great scheme, there's nobody that should be able to beat us, right? And I mean that that wins you a lot of games. I think after losing twice to Michigan, the approach has shifted to we have to understand how to fight and learn and grow to be able to come out and win tough games. And every single game is an opportunity to improve and to learn again how to fight and win. And we don't have C.J. Stroud to cover up a lot of minor executing issues, right, that end up catching up with us later on. So we're going to go through it the hard way. And that means there's going to be a lot of ugly wins, but we're going we're gonna to get wins and we're going to continue to build. And I think – that's growth from a head coaching standpoint. Ryan Day was always, you know, great quarterback coach, great offensive coordinator. Now he, he, he's leading it more of, okay, we have a good defense. So we're just going to focus on winning, right? We took a knee. It took a knee. This, this is, this is the, the, the moment where, you know, things have changed a little bit. It's, it's the second quarter right before halftime. I don't know if there was maybe 40-something seconds left on the clock. The, the series before, there was a sack fumble. Penn State return for a touchdown. They got called back for a defensive hold, right? So that's in the back of his mind. Next opportunity out, instead of at least running the ball, doing a screen, something conservative to see if you pop one and you can try to go out there and get a field goal or, or a touchdown, they just take a knee. <laughs> like, let's just get to the locker room. <laughs> and, and that's Ryan Day. I, I would rather them have run the ball because if you, you know, you break one for 30 yards, let's go try to score. But that's him understanding, look, we just need to get the win, right? I'm an offensive coach. I can go out there and scheme up a defense, but all my defense is rolling. So let's go get the win. And this is why this to me, Ryan Day has 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 shifted to a coach who is well positioned to win in the Big Ten and, and really go after and chase a national championship because of that, because he understands and he's telling his players that we have to fight for every inch. And that's how we could, we're, we're gonna win. So it may not be a, a blowout at Wisconsin, but our focus is making sure that we come out with the win. Well, that's scary because we start super slow. I mean, <laughs> slow and like we're stuck in mud. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't want to get into a fist fight with Ohio State, but I also don't think that our guys. I, I can't see us scoring fifty points and holding Ohio State to seven. Like that to me doesn't seem like a score. It seems like a thirty-four, thirty-one type of game, like where where people are just doing too, trying too much, trying to do too much, and are just big plays are happening. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie, Bernie. Yeah. I don't see many teams in the country putting 31 points on Ohio state this year. I think the I, Ohio I'm state saying, defense has taken like I've taken a couple steps forward in what is this? Knowles's third year as coordinator or second year as coordinator. Second, second, second year. year. Okay. Well, I think they're saying they, crazier they, things have happened. All I'm saying is I don't want to be in a toe to toe fist fight with Ohio state on, on Saturday night. Oh, I yeah. guess I do. I'd rather be in a fist fight than a blowout, I guess. Yeah, I think the yeah. avenue, the avenue for victory for Wisconsin is, you know, Ohio State just came off the big one. Yep. And we are all human beings. I don't care what they <laughs> – and this is – this. I think this was – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I was a little arrogant our senior year when we lost to Wisconsin. I honestly thought, like, there's no team 
I'm watching Auburn and um, Cam Newton, you know, play. And I'm like, they got this one guy who is otherworldly, but the rest of this 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 team, this is a, there's no team in, the, in in college football that can beat us. That's the way I felt. Um, and no matter what the coaches told us going into that Wisconsin game, I'm like, there's no way Wisconsin is beating. Us. <laughs> like, there's no possible <laughs> pathway for them to beat us. And you know, I think coming off a of Penn State win, um, that that kind of mindset is the avenue for Wisconsin to be able to come out there. If the offense is a little out of sync, I think the defense will play relatively well. But if they're not locked in, um, a good r- rushing attack can get them. I mean, if when you look at the defense, they do everything great. But if there's a way to gain, gain, get some yards on them, it's downhill uh, running the ball, which, you know, you can squeak through and get some explosive runs. And then that, you know, that that gives you an avenue to get something rolling in offense. So I think that's the pathway to victory is one, a letdown after a big win, and then Wisconsin starting fast. They would have to start fast, right? <laughs> yeah, they had to start fast. But you they know, have- but Brian, like like you said, I, you you brought up a thing that you said, you know, what that's something that's kind of concerns us. What concerns yeah, me and Chimo, I guess, you know, going to the game. You know, whenever our biggest thing is off of the on offense, the off of the line, and what they've been doing throughout the season, how they've been trying to improve, and they have been improving. Uh, and last week against Fitz, you know, obviously there's some things squeak through, but they played a pretty solid game. I would say, but now we're looking at the three three five defense where things the rules has changed a ton, right? Three three five, you could have guys coming from all over the place. So if it's a way to beat Ohio State, you run that three three five defense. Maybe you get our, our guys confused up front, and once again, you 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 get a sack fumble that's returned, and maybe there's not a hole down down downfield that doesn't get called back. So yeah, I mean. That's definitely a possibility. I know that I'm sure they've been waiting and saving some things for this game for Ohio State to kind of bring out some list packages to kind of shake things up and see what they can get get out of it. So and Brian, be prepared. We're gonna be breaking down some some missed blocks because I mean Figure's gonna see the blitzes that confuse some of the guys. They're gonna they're gonna attack it the same way. They're gonna look and see, you know, I, I remember some of our design blitzes when we played, you know. Uh, linemen engaging and dropping out of it, right? Just to get the the offensive lineman confused. So they're, they're going to have some out there that that probably confuse us offensively. And then you still have Kyle McCord, who so he has one interception on the year. Okay, so this really taking done a great job of taking care of the ball. But if you watch the games, every game there is a like two drop picks or there's a sack fumble for a touchdown that got called back for. So there's there was more out there. But so far, I've done, they, they, you know, over outside of those, done a good job of taking care of the ball. So. Well, my question for you, Tim, was going to be, what's the state of the running backs? Because Trayvon Henderson has been, like, injured and in and out. And, like, it seems, where does, where do the Buckeyes stand right now when it comes to their running back room? Yeah, the weird, this is kind of the weirdest area in college football at Ohio State to me because I never know who's playing each game. <laughs> you find out. And everybody else finds out, and that's when the first the ball is snapped, and the first guy gets a carry. Um, so I don't know the state of the running backs, right? I don't know if, if Travion is playing. I don't know if Mayan had an injury between um, his final play in Ohio State and you know him taking a shower and and <laughs> practicing up until this next game. So I honestly don't know. I I, I do think they will have two good running backs <laughs> that are are ready to play. Um, and if not, they have a guy, Dallin Hayden, who they've been trying to save and, and keep his red shirt for this year. But he had to come in after a couple injuries um, against Purdue. And he played great. He played really good. Um, and Buckeye fans are calling for them to just, you know, let him play. Um, let but, the kids play. <laughs> let, let him play. But uh, not, but I expect Trevion to be back. Um, I don't know exactly what the injury is, but I, it does a, appear that he tried to go last last week, which means he likely is ready to go um, this week. And then Emeka Buka, who's not a running back, but a receiver, another big time receiver, he's likely to be back this uh, this week as well. Yeah, that's that's definitely good for them to sort of get the pressure off a little bit of Harrison, who was, again, incredible against Penn State. What, 11 catches, 162 yards, I think, something along those lines. Another, an, another huge game. For him, uh, you know, Julian Fleming still in the mix. Carnell Tate, the true freshman. I know he – I saw him make at least, like, two catches that, like, humans shouldn't be able to make. Um, 
Yeah, Ohio State has these receivers that are literally just growing trees. It's just like <laughs> one guy gets hurt, and we're just gonna, you know, we'll pick that that guy right there. Yeah, he's an explosive guy too. He hasn't played much, but when he gets the ball, he's probably gonna, he can he can go for six. So it's kind of it's an abundance abundance of riches at the receiver position. But Marvin Harrison still, I mean, it doesn't matter who they got. Marvin Harrison's the guy. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, he he really is, and it's it, he's special to watch. Like he's absolutely special to watch, and you see why he is that dude so uh you know so as when the Buckeyes are on defense though you know I think a lot of people know about JT Tui Malau um the edge rusher who is you know just incredible but who else should Badger fans specifically be looking out for what are some of the names to know on that defense you know especially in the in the, in the defensive back in the secondary yeah. because Wisconsin is trying to throw the ball a lot more yeah I think that's Ohio State's strength this year, which was really a weakness of last year, is their secondary. Um, and it's all across the board. I mean, we had the, the best guy is Denzel Burke, the, the corner. I think he's a, a top five corner in the, in the nation. He was out last week. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't even tell. All right, Jordan Hancock came in. Davidson, uh, even Nelson, who came from, who transferred from Ole Miss, who was a freshman All-American, um, really held down the cornerback position. And then Jordan uh, uh, Matthews, who is a, a freshman corner, is another great player. I think you mentioned J- JT, and then our 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 safeties are really good. Um, you know, Lathan Ransom and Josh Proctor really make a lot of plays. There's a from pressuring to playing deep to you know guarding tight ends, getting the running back out the backfield. Very really impressive. I think where I'm, I wouldn't say I'm dis, I'm not disappointed. It, I think. The, Maybe this year the biggest weakness is probably the linebacker position. Um, really great blitzing linebackers, and we did a lot of pressures last year. This this year has been more of um, don't give up the explosives. Everybody, you know, do their job, play base. And there's been opportunities in the run game um, against these linebackers. And I think um, the, at the tackle positions, uh, uh, Williams, uh, Mike Hall, these guys are – Impressive, <laughs> really across the board. Man. It's, it's a oh, very yeah, yeah, all those player. guys. Yeah, um, Eichenberg's a great linebacker, and they you get good production out of linebackers. But if there's a position where I say, you know, there's really some opportunities for the offense to make some plays in the pass game and in the run game, is really trying to put those linebackers in tough positions. Attention, athletes! Do you want a frictionless and tailored financial planning experience to secure your future? Well, look no further. Introducing Oak Bridge Wealth Management the premier financial planning firm for professional athletes. Led by wealth manager, Chris Anasetti, our team provides a unique and comprehensive approach, ensuring your financial success both on and off the field. We understand the unique challenges you face as a professional athlete, from managing cash flow habits to planning major business purchases and navigating complex contracts. That's why we've developed a proven process, working closely with our strategic partners to provide seamless solutions for your unique financial journey. Our services evolve with your career, offering short, mid, and long-term goal setting, portfolio optimization, real estate investments, and more. As you transition to life beyond the field, we support you with career development and philanthropic ventures. But don't just take our word for it. Top NFL players like Chase Boulier, Tyler Biotish, Alec Ingold, and more trust Oak Bridge Wealth Management to guide them towards financial success. Troy Dye of the Minnesota Vikings says, I really love the work that Chris and the rest of the Oak Bridge group do. I especially like the honesty and transparency when it comes to setting up financial goals and plans that best fit my needs and situation. It's time to elevate your financial game plan. Connect with Chris on Instagram at OakbridgeWM underscore Anacete. That's OakbridgeWM underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. And join the winning team. <laughs> what do y'all want to know about the Badgers? I, I think... I, can the quarterback scramble? I'm looking at some yards here, and I was looking at the stats. And it looks like he may have a little running wiggle. So maybe. we could scramble, and then Mordecai got injured, and then and he's out. Uh, so he he's done. He broke he's a, out. He's done. Broke a bone in his hand. Uh, in his uh, throwing throwing hand. hand. So uh, okay. yeah, he's out. So Braden Locke made his first start last week against Illinois. 
of course, career start um, against Illinois last week. Uh, took him a minute to sort of get in rhythm, but I think in a lot of ways he's actually, I mean, he's a Texas kid who grew up, you know, playing Texas football, right? You know, they're, they're playing air raids from six years old. He's been taking shotgun snaps back there. And it's interesting to watch him, you know, because Mordecai, they were starting to utilize him in a little bit of zone running. He was, you know, uh, especially in the red zone, they were using Mordecai's legs a lot, but Locke is just, he's going to sit in the pack and wants to pick you apart. Like he's, he's not a runner. What, what was, what led that comeback versus Illinois? Vern? You know, relying on a run game. Braylon Allen is the guy you were talking about. He's been awesome. You know, f- f- five yards per carry. Um, I like this kid, Braden Locke. I mean, he's young. He's a gunslinger. That's what I like about him. He uh, he went 50%, but he went 10 for 17, I think, in third downs, which the game before against Iowa, did two for 17. Um, my one concern is if you touch him, he'll fumble. So, like, I don't want to hear there's an edge rusher or anybody coming near him. <laughs> um, Tanner Mordecai was a runner. He would, he would pull it down. He was like a Brooks Bollinger from the early 2000s. You know, could sit in the pocket, throw, but then he would run. They'd call draws and all this type of stuff. That's not a the, that's not Braden Locke's game. So he's going to sit in there. He's going to throw it, and he trusted his guys to make plays. And I think that's an Ohio State thing, right? You you throw the ball up and you give your your guys the best option to make it. And we got some young dudes. If they get a little bit of confidence, we're going to be go- We're going to be good. We're going to put up a fight. And I think that's what happened in the fifth in the fourth quarter. I think Fix said something, or somebody on the team said something. And they just stop playing to to lose. Does that make sense? And then they stop playing yeah, not yeah. to lose. And said they stop playing not to lose. And yeah. they just said, "Let's go out. Let's throw some deep balls. Let's take advantage." And they did it. And the and these guys stepped up to play. And I think we have a lot of we have some we have transfer guys. We have some young guys um, at wide receiver. But I think they're they're all so much better than the past couple of years you've seen. I think our talent is way up. On offense and on defense too. I mean, I think our DBs are much better than they've they've been in the past. Um, I'm a little nervous for our run defense. I don't think we know the fits quite right, um, but somehow they could lock it up and do a little bit better. We could be better. Have, you know, it's, have, we're still growing. Have they gotten better? Have you know? Have do you think that they've improved throughout this year? When I think of a. See, the thing about Coach Fickle to me is that he's someone who develops players and helps them understand understand a lot about the defense. I played for him. Marcus Freeman at one point, who's the head coach at Notre Dame, was our linebacker. Uh, and when I came in as a freshman, Marcus is telling me how to line up in certain situations. He's letting me know, like, hey, this is what they like to do to the boundary. You may want to play inside. And he's a linebacker, right? You know, like um, – and – my what I imagine in a coach a coach fickle team is getting better and at least defensively. I don't know about the offense, but defensively, they're getting better throughout the season. Have you seen that? Do you do you think that's accurate in this sense? I, I think that the defense has made significant strides. And a lot of it goes back to the fact that they've been they were playing a three four for 10 years, right? Under going all the way back to Dave Aranda, Justin Wilcox, Jimmy Leonard. Um, they've been playing a three, four, and basically they asked all their DBs to go back and sit in zone all day. That's what they did. They sat in zone. They would bring weird and interesting linebacker stunts and blitzes and stuff like that. And say, have the, have them go back and sit in either cover two, cover three or cover four and say, you know, do your thing now under the three, three, five, they're asking them corners to play man all the dang time. They are, you know, in, and with that, they're starting a nickelback like they never had a starting nickelback before, right? And so, like, they have a starting nickelback who just follows the slot receiver around. Wherever they go, he's following the slot receiver, Jason Matry, the Boston College transfer. And so they're asking guys to do, like, very, very different things. Um, and you can see them starting to acclimate to that role, especially against the pass. Now, against the run, like Bernie said, like, the run fits still aren't there, right? We see guys peaking a lot. We see guys... Um, you know, especially the defensive lineman, it's been tough because the defensive line is probably the position group on the roster that has the least amount of talent. Just if you look at like, you know, star ratings and stuff like that coming out of high school and, you know, past production at the collegiate level, you combine those two and the defensive line is definitely the lowest 
uh, probably graded out position group. And so asking them, especially they have to basically, their job is just to occupy a bunch of blocks and just like uh, hold up a bunch of fat guys so mm -hmm. that the offensive, so that the linebackers and safeties can come up and make a bunch of tackles. Right. And that's been a tough transition for a lot of those guys. I think the one who's been the best this season is James Thompson. And he was in, he's been nicked up and injured um, in the, for the last couple of games. So getting him back to hundred percent will be a, a boon for this defensive line. If he is able to go, otherwise they're relying on a lot of guys who haven't seen, a, who haven't seen a lot of football along the defensive line. And so, you know, and, and, in watching in watching Penn State, who I think has a very strong defensive line, yeah. um, you know, I, I really noticed uh, Carson Hinsman, the center for Ohio State, did a really, really good job. He's a Wisconsin native too. Wisconsin fans are still bitter about uh, that recruiting battle uh, <laughs> from a couple of years ago. But just the, the the Ohio State offensive line in general, and Brian, you can probably talk about this a little bit more, but it, it seems like that unit is starting to come together a little bit, and I would worry about their ability to bully Wisconsin up front. Yeah, whenever I think about three, three, five defenses, like I just like running the ball straight. I mean, literally, like this old school. Because once again, it's only three down linemen. You should be able to kind of get some some solid double team. And you know, once you get moving on that D linemen, then you know you kind of you kind of you should be getting yards first off right away. You might not might be the biggest game, but you should be getting something once you kind of move. You know, once you kind of replace that defensive lineman while you're working up to the second level. So. I mean, early in the year, we was having some struggles with second level. So, I mean, like I said, last couple of games, we've been seeing a lot of improvement, us getting to the second level and uh, actually making contact with linebackers and, and making blocks. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see. Like I said, I, I, I'm not like, you know, I, I believe we're the best team, the better team. I believe we'll win. But I could see some things kind of coming up that could really give us some troubles just knowing off what we've been struggling with throughout the year. So, yeah, And it feels like a couple games too late. I feel like. The, the offensive line has progressed enough the last couple of weeks and that I don't expect them to go back to the, the issues that they were dealing with before. <laughs> However, uh, just knowing a fickle and probably his approach, um, if the defense got, if the defense, if the linebackers and stuff can handle it, they, he's going to have guys walk into gaps, try to try to confuse the offensive line, bring pressure in other, in other areas. Um, that's what we did <laughs> at Ohio state. Um, so I, I would expect him to see some of those mistakes and see if he can, you know, force guys to to fall into some of those traps again. But, yeah, I, I think the, the offensive line has been much improved here recently. I, I would I would think we have to be on the attack the entire game. Like we can't sit back where we can't play base defense. I think we have to be in a confusing attack, you know, physical, violent way. My thing is the run fits haven't worked off of our base defense. So I think we're going to have to figure something out there. You know, Jimmy, you said it too. You played on the Raiders for a bunch of different coaches. Imagine being recruited to play in the three, four, and then all of a sudden one year you've done it for five, four, five, six with the COVID year. You might've been there for eight years doing three, four, and then all of a sudden it's a three, three, yeah. you know, maybe as a DB, it's not as different, but for the D, you know, maybe Brian, you could say, but for the D line yeah. linebackers, it's completely new. You know, we're asking our guys to get into zones. Our, our line, I actually think our linebackers are great athletes, but when they're in the zone looking for dudes, they don't find them because yeah. I don't think it's what they've normally done. So they kind of revert back to – it's not bad habits, just old habits. Um, but if we can get some kind of run blitzes going and we can call plays – you ever play NFL blitz? Like if you call the other team's <laughs> play, you, it's like a sack every time. Like if we can get some confusing <laughs> attack – make the ball come out quick, double team, you know, Harrison or do whatever we're going to do, just make things confusing. I think we have a shot in, in that, in that way. I mean, we got players, we got guys, but I think they're learning the scheme, but they're getting better, but learning the scheme and getting better. And then playing a number three, number two, Ohio state is a lot different than playing an Indiana or Northwestern or Minnesota. Yeah. I think whatever you do, you got to do early. You got to do it early and it has to be successful early because Come third quarter, Ryan Day kind of gets an understanding of how you're attacking. Unless you got two separate game plans, <laughs> he starts to understand how you're how you're attacking them defensively, and he's going to have something for it. I think, you know, it's pick your poison um, because most teams have receivers who are explosive, but then there's Marvin Harrison Jr. So now you 
you the, the disguise part is very very important this is where disguise becomes very very important because you know all the blitzes all that stuff is important but you have to show the quarterback that you have this guy covered mm -hmm. uh, because if you show any <laughs> if you show any sign of him being uncovered or being covered by single coverage and his opportunity then it's just if we get the ball in his vicinity he's going to make it happen so uh, that becomes a challenge. I think the disguise becomes very, very important because of that. Um, and you have to get them if you get them early, and you know you get like a sack fumble, like what happened to Penn State. Then you get the offense on their heels a little bit. But if you don't get them early, and and what you throw throw, throw at them doesn't work early by the third quarter, I think you know historically, not just this season, but historically, Ryan Day's offense has been able to figure out something in that third quarter to really start opening up that offense. Speaking of Harrison, so, I mean, you guys have been following the Buckeyes for a long time. Fill in the blank. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the blank best receiver in Ohio State history. <laughs> uh, Go ahead, B. He, uh, blank. Uh, I forgot the whole sentence, but he's definitely one of the greatest ever to do it at Ohio State. And he should State. put a number. Is he, t is he number yeah. one? Is he number two? Is he number four? Is he number eight? That's tough, man. He's talking about a lot of great wide receivers. <laughs> but I, I would say he's definitely the best on this team. No. Okay. Because <laughs> no, I mean, you, this, you guys played with Ted time. Ginn, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so I went so to high school with Ted Ginn. So, yeah, so I've been watching him for a long time. <laughs> so you guys know what good, like, because to me, like, watching Ted Ginn play was like, that dude is out of this world. Like, yeah. out of this world good and so i mean he's a very different player than marvin but you know you know he can like he's just, just going back man all those freaking ohio state receivers it's just it's insane how long it's been and how many good ones have come through there and that yeah i would so say many guys talk about him being the best one yeah i would say to me though you know watching him and compared to the other guys especially in recent history right all the guys that's having success in the nfl gary wilson chris olave um Jackson you know, what's his name? Michael Thomas, uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, I, I feel that is since he's kind of to me, like I said, I don't even know measurements, but in my head, he's the biggest one out of them. So he's the most, he's the easiest to kind of find. He's the most quarterback friendly just due to sheer speed and the size. So his to me, he has the largest catch radius. I know Gary Wilson could make the most craziest catches, I feel, uh, most with the ball skills, but he just has a huge catch radius so to me he's just he just always feels open like with the other guys like if you you know chris alave could really run by guys the other guys they were really good at doing certain different things but he just could do it all and i just feel like he's just really quarterback friendly so especially watching mccord who could sometimes get off the slow starts um he just started chucking it to marvin harrison jr and actually and now everything else is just flowing and he just really has the ability to do that and um, I feel like that's what really makes him special. That he's one of those guys that no matter who the quarterback is, he can have outstanding stats because he's just he just to me he just makes it easy, makes it look real easy. <laughs> I think he's number one, man. I think he's number one. Honestly, I, I um and I don't think it's about much, right? It's, it's, I mean, guys have different style of play, right? My favorite receiver in uh, in Ohio State history. Now I didn't grow up Ohio, I didn't grow up watching Ohio State, so there's some guys like Chris Carter. Uh, um, Joey Galloway. It, I mean, there, there's some guys that are, you know, that I didn't watch play. Um, but from the David Boston and on um, era, uh, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. And it's not because of just athletic ability and talent and gifts. Like to me, Garrett Wilson is my favorite Ohio State receiver um, because he can, you throw the ball up. And he can jump off of one leg and catch the ball in the in the craziest way. He's like an alien to me, right? <laughs> but Marvin Harrison, he since his 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 first time I've seen him run around, the 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 skill and the nuance. It, you can tell he came from football royalty, right? Is is because like he does some things that if I was in in college, um, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gone against it. Right? I just wouldn't have. You know, part of uh, playing football and playing it well is you, you do it all the time. And, you know, uh, you're able to react to stuff because you've seen it time and time again. And he's one of the ones that you just you just never seen it. Um, and with the size of Brian mentioned, his size and his catch radius, 
And then his ability to get in and out of breaks to give you a little bit extra at the top of the route. It's small things that just at this level, I don't think a lot of those players who had long NFL careers who got to that point at some point were, were that far ahead in college. I think he's just a little bit further ahead than other guys in some of the extra stuff that make you a great a great receiver. Um, from a defensive back's perspective, for me saying, that if I was guarding him, <laughs> how would I fear? Um, that's kind of how I see it. So, 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 Jimmy, what do you do? Like, what, what should the Badgers even try to accomplish to contain an athlete like Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah, you got to commit two to him. You commit two to him, but you do it in a way that allows that second guy, usually a, a safety, right? But allows that guy to also uh, keep eyes on the quarterback and re- and react to the ball if it's not going to Marvin Harris. Notre Dame did. I think Notre Dame did it well. And it also is what led to them giving up that, that last uh, touchdown on the last drive where they will have a guy, you know, jamming up Marvin Harrison. They will have a guy deep. But if the quarterback wasn't looking at him, that guy could, could come rob something else. Um, hmm. And over time, you know, Ryan Day and the offense started to scheme it up, right? They know that this guy's committed to Marvin Harrison. He also has a running back who's in the backfield. So we're going to release his running back so that we can pull this guy out. So they started to, but I think, I think you can disguise and you can and you can do different things with that guy who's committed to him that doesn't just make him a double on Marvin Harris. He's he's also um helping out other guys. And you just have to not allow you can't show your hand before the snap. Just can't show your hand before the snap. And you got to make Kyle McCord work to know where to go with the ball. And if you talk about where you know some of our issues with Ohio State currently, McCord takes sometimes takes a little bit too long to process. Takes a little bit too long to get his feet set, and that's where if you can hit him with a disguise, if you can get him with pressure, if you can uh, commit a guy to Marvin Harrison, um, you can get him confused enough that if you're getting pressure on him, it makes it hard for him to get his feet set. Even if he gets the ball off, it's, it's, it's likely going to be inaccurate. So um, that's the opportunity. It's it's a tall task, but there's a formula out there. It just depends. On can you can that can your defense get it done? Yeah, yeah. I had a question for you guys. Um, Iowa lost this week. Iowa lost this week, right? So you guys are now uh, first place in the West. So you guys are kind of tabbing in the driver's seat, right, to kind of get to the Big Ten Championship. How you guys feeling about that? Like, uh, uh, you got to play the games, right? You got to play them. <laughs> well, so Iowa still has the tiebreaker against us, right? And so we've if, we've got the game with y'all this weekend. And, you know, like Bertie said, that there's a 0.1% chance that Wisconsin pulls it out. And so, listen, I think there's more, but okay, that's so. only because I'm optimistic for the Badgers. And I think a lot of things come together. Listen, I'm going to be there. Gilreath isn't going to be there. So maybe I have to fly him in. But I think <laughs> you I, I won't, think you won't we, make that flight. Special teams. Special teams. <laughs> well, so that's another problem. Wisconsin special teams out We they got a transfer kicker who's been really good. Outside of that, special teams have left a lot to be desired. In seven games, they've kicked five balls out of bounds on kickoffs. Mm. Which, you know, just w- handing the ball to Ohio State at the 35-yard line is not a great way to start a drive. Like, yeah. don't really want to just give them that extra real estate, right? And so that that is concerning. And But going back to Brian's question, though, about being the driver's seat in the West, Iowa still has the tiebreaker over us. And assuming that the game this weekend goes how most people think it will go with an Ohio state victory, then Wisconsin, Iowa are tied and Iowa has the tiebreaker. And so with Wisconsin, cause they defeated the Badgers, you know, a week and a half ago, a game that I will never rewatch because <laughs> I like, you can't get that. You can't get that. You can't get that time back, man. But I think that, you know, Iowa's offense is historically inept and which means that they on any given weekend could lose to anyone. We just saw them lose to, to, to Minnesota, who is no great chance right. this year. And so can Wisconsin put Do I believe that Wisconsin can sort of put it together? Yes, but maybe in the post Ohio state portion of their schedule. I mean, I'm really looking forward to be back for the Nebraska game that Bernie and I will be at together, uh, you know, later in November, but I, you know, while I think a lot of people were optimistic that Wisconsin would win the West this year, that loss to Iowa, you know, dealt it a huge blow because Iowa has that advantage now in terms of having that head-to-head tiebreaker. 
burn. Yeah, we gotta play the games, game. though. You gotta play you the gotta games. Play the games. <laughs> you gotta play the games. Listen, if one or two big things swing our way, you never know. You know, like you never know. I, I'm just excited because it's it's home at night, and there have been magical, miracle things that have happened at Camp Randall at night against Ohio against State Ohio teams State. <laughs> that were number one in the country. I, what was Gilreath? That year, you guys were they were number uh, one. Yeah. Was, was number one. You were number one. We that got number one that week. We got ne- we got number one that week. That week. Oh man, we now I'm one. so sorry yeah. to keep bringing that up. That must really <laughs> suck. Bernie, your um, game, your game, uh, 2003 game was I think they were number three, and you guys three. were 22. You were 19 and 0, I think, up till that point. Coming into that one, yeah. Coming into that one, you're national champs. I mean, when you think, you know, you guys were players. When you have nothing to lose. People play better, and I think no one's giving our guys a chance. And I'm hoping that they take that and use it, right? And play like bullies with a chip on their shoulder. I, I haven't seen it up until the fourth quarter against Illinois. So, if we can play like that, it's going to be a good game. If you get us first quarter Illinois, we have no chance. But if you know if Ohio State doesn't play well, it you know you're not going to win every game. So you, you're right. You, you got to play every play like it's your last play. And if the Badgers can somehow get that message out and say, hey, listen, we're the underdogs and they're coming into our home, just go out there and have fun and play football. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. yeah. I'll be I, drinking up, up on the top of the uh, the top of the uh, s- uh, the south end zone. So no matter what happens, I know I'm going to have a great time. Have a good night. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just don't see it happening. I, I, just, I just don't. I After just, all that, I just don't see it. Happening. I just don't see it happening. I just feel like, I feel like, I feel like one of the reasons, one of the reasons we we lost that game in 2010. I think our, I think even though the coaches came in and, and preached the the gospel about this is going to be another all season though. If you remember, Trust was talking yeah. about that game all off season, all getting off ready season. to go on the road to up in Cameron. Yeah. But I, I honestly think they fell in they fell to the same trap that we fell into in terms of how we played offense in that game in the first half, the plays we called, it was un, yeah. it was it was not the place we should have called. All that no. option and stuff on the edges, right into uh, you know, yeah, the the strength of JJ Watt's wheelhouse. Right? <laughs> like I'm, I'm as a defensive player, I'm watching. I'm like, what are we doing? Run the ball straight. Run the ball straight. We always run the ball straight. Run the ball straight. And then second half, we able to get back on track. Now we lost a special teams battle in that game. Mm-hmm. So. You have to. I mean, I think the formula to win is you have to. You have to play good defense. You have to keep the top on the defense on the um, on the offense. You have to win the special teams. You have to win the rushing, and then from there, there's a chance. Like there's any anything can happen if they can't if they can't create explosives. That means you keep the game in balance. If you win the special teams, that means you you know you you've gained some hidden yards in there. You give yourself an opportunity, and then at that point, then it just becomes a dog fight and who who can. I don't see it happening. <laughs> I do not see it happening. I'm really adamant. I think at this point in the season, um, and the way Ryan Day has 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 coached the fight, and the most important thing is winning. I think they are in a good spot to make sure they come back home with this win. But as you mentioned, anything can happen. I just I just can't see it. <laughs> but you wouldn't be believing, you know, the Buckeyes if you guys didn't believe, and you wouldn't <laughs> right. be believing Badgers exactly. if we didn't believe. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's right. You're believing twenty one percent. Well, you, you're, hey, you're, you're, it's probably more than that, but you know, it, it's got to be more than that. But I, listen, I'm a believer in our guys. I don't think I. I'm the worst though. I'm a twelve and zero guy. Like I'm just yeah. stuck, and I don't want to ever say that we have no chance. Like I just, there's just no way I can do it. Because I've been, you guys have been there. I've been there. When teams are like, oh, you no chance. They've just won the national championship. They're 18 and 0. You guys have no chance. You're 22. There's no way. And then what happens? You come in, it rains, and it's a disgusting day. And our O line was fantastic. And guess what? We ran the ball. And Lee Evans had this miracle catch that we, dude, I ran a 12 yard out. Chimdy, would you ever even guard me at 12 yards? Like, why would you? <laughs> and, and, I was even laid off the ball. That's how bad I – that's how much I knew that play was going to work because I didn't want to jump off sides. Um, so, I'm listen, I'm hoping for a miracle. It can happen. 
I think it's better than 0.01. But listen, we got to do a lot of things. The turnover battle, the um, special teams battle, can't make mistakes, can't have penalties. This is what everyone preaches all the time, but like we have to live that. You're playing a mammoth team with guys who almost most of them will play in the NFL. So you can't do anything to hurt yourself, and you got to play better than you've ever played. It's a tall, it's a tall cup to drink. It is. It, it is. is. But it's it's, 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 I, I'm excited. I'm excited for Coach Fick. I know that uh, you know this game is going to be a little bit extra to him, no matter what he says to the press this week. He's saying, "Oh, it's all about the guys. All about the guys, Coach." Like it's allowed to be about you for a second. Like <laughs> that's okay. I know he'll never admit it. But, you know, it is going to be – it's going to be a fun one. It's always a fun one when uh, Wisconsin and Ohio State get together, except for when it's in the Big Ten Championship game because then it's <laughs> less fun. Now, if we're talking about the Big Ten Championship game, I'd give us pretty much no chance. But we're not talking about that. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and we're not going against Ezekiel Elliott and Cardale Jones. So, um, but uh, I think, yeah, so let's, uh, let's get out of here with, with a final score prediction from everyone. I guess I will go ahead and start – um, I, you know, I love Wisconsin. Everyone knows this, but I'm just the pragmatic part of me. I still think Ohio State's going to end up winning this one. 27 to 17 is my final score uh, prediction. Lower scoring game, you know, moving the clock along a little bit. I've got, I think Ohio State wins 27 to 17. I'll throw it over uh, to Bryant next. Yeah, I'm going to go with, uh, I, I, I don't think Ohio State scores a ton of points. I think the 3 3 5 will they better do some things to kind of slow us down. So I like this point with Ohio State at 27, but I'm only giving Wisconsin like seven points. I think this is pretty well. Uh, young quarterback, I think we'll be able to kind of lock in there and make things pretty muddy for them. So I'm going to go 27-7 Ohio State. Believe in Buckeyes. <laughs> Jim. Should I go next? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say 38-10 to 10. Ohio State. Um, controls the game for most of the game, and they blow it up open in the second half. Um, I don't think – I just don't think Wisconsin will have enough to contain the explosives of uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. And then, you know, from then on, I think that kind of is what opens it up, and it's going to be hard to put the top back on after that. So <laughs> 38 to 10 um, is my prediction. That's that last seven points you get late because – um, they fall asleep. <laughs> <in the game>. <laughs> <laughs> three, three points for most of the game, in my, in my opinion. I hope I'm not flying in for that. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going, I'm going, uh, miracle on ice style. Uh -huh. I'm saying it's 2017 Badgers. We do enough, we confuse, we play unrelenting, reckless football. No, not scared to make a mistake, and we win the turnover battle. I think that's the only way we do it. So I'm excited. Even if we get blown out, I'm still excited to be in the stadium and watch the game. Also, I'm kind of a fan of Ohio State. I literally hate Michigan with all my guts. So yeah. I feel like we have something hey, that, in common. Good man, good man. <laughs> yeah, I almost introduced Bernie tonight as the only man who hates Michigan as much as Ohio State. So. Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm with you there, the cheater. Yeah. I, I will add, I will add the, the last thing is that Fickle is the head coach in the Big Ten that scares me the most. Outside of the the Michigan team that has spies on their, their side as well. But Fickle is the one coach that scares me the most. It's just in this first year, I just feel like he hasn't been there long enough. So I'm I'm confident for year one and the next year. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. It's now, exciting. Yeah. This was fantastic, guys. We really appreciate y'all yeah. having us. You know, you guys come joining us here today to chop it up and talk about the game. We're all very excited about it, as always. We appreciate everyone tuning in. Make sure that you are subscribing uh, to Believe in Buckeyes with these guys because you are not going to find better Ohio State insights anywhere else in the known universe. Um, we appreciate everyone tuning in to Believe in Badgers, Believe in Buckeyes on the Believe Network. Uh, presented by betonline.ag and our friends over at Oak Ridge Wealth Management. So uh, I don't think we'll get these guys to say it, but we'll say it until next time on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. What is that? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. <laughs> it's the W, baby. It's the W. <laughs>